purpose of this lesson is to show that you can use the law of conservation of energy as well as the law of conservation of momentum to solve not only translational problems, but we're going to focus on rotational problems. These two laws are really the hammers that can take care of any rotation problem, and that's what we're going to show today. These rotation problems are no match for these two hammers. And our problems are going to be solved. We'll start by defining angular momentum by looking back at a previously well-known term, linear momentum. Linear momentum is just the product of mass times velocity. Angular momentum is the same concept, only we're in a rotating system and rotating coordinates about an axis, so we're going to use our analogous term for mass, which is moment of inertia, and we're going to use our analogous term for velocity, which is angular velocity. So angular momentum is just the product of moment of inertia times angular velocity. The moment of inertia term, I, tells you how easy it is to rotate something. Now different shapes are going to have a different value for I, so I suggest reviewing those values for moments of inertia before proceeding. In its definition, moment of inertia is dependent on the summation of masses and their locations squared from the pivot. Notice that there's an R-squared dependence on moment of inertia, meaning if you have more mass further away, that's going to make it more difficult to turn it about a pivot. And if you have more mass closer to the pivot, it's going to be much easier to turn. And when we conserve angular momentum, if we ever decide to change the location of our masses about a pivot, there's going to have to be a change in our angular velocity to account for this difference. Watch as this student with angular momentum decides to change his moment of inertia. The angular velocity of the student then must change correspondingly. But we don't have to change the moment of inertia in order to illustrate the conservation of angular momentum. Right, Watch as this student flips the wheel upside down, changing the yeah. angular velocity of the wheel. Now flip it over as fast as you can. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Other way. Okay. Oh. I should have came to a complete stop. By flipping the wheel upside down, the student reverses the direction of the spin, causing a change in the angular momentum of the wheel. But the student's body must then spin the other direction to conserve angular momentum. And now the moment you've all been waiting for. A physics problem. Say a 50 kilogram student in that rolly chair has two dumbbells of 10 kilograms each, and he holds them at arm's length, we'll call that one meter, and he rotates with an angular velocity of two revolutions per second. They're going to quickly bring their arms inwards to their chest, we'll say the diameter of the torso's 40 centimeters, and determine the new angular velocity of the system. And we're going to approximate the body of a student as a cylinder. So let's bring out that hammer. Conservation of angular momentum says that the total sum of all of our angular momentum initial equals the total sum of all of our angular momentum final. Sometimes we may have more than one item with more than one moment of inertia and angular momentum in the beginning and at the end. In this case, we've got moment of inertia of a student. That's not going to change from beginning to end. But we also have moment of inertia of dumbbells, which are going to have two different positions, so those values are going to change and so will our angular velocity initial and final. We can combine like terms to come up with a simplified expression, and as you'll see from here forward, we've pretty much done all the physics, and now it's just down to some math. We can substitute our values for moments of inertia of the student and of the dumbbells, and we can rewrite this expression for omega final. Insert our given values, and simplify. Game over. For that last problem, we only really needed one of our two hammers, the law of conservation of momentum. But sometimes, you might need to take both sledgehammers to a rotation problem. Say we have a mass m at height h above a teeter-totter. It's going to fall, hitting the teeter-totter at exactly a quarter of its length, causing the whole system to rotate. And we want to know the final angular velocity of the rotating teeter-totter. First, we start with the law of conservation of energy. This will help us determine the speed of the mass just before it hits the teeter-totter. We must choose this time frame because as soon as that collision happens, it's inelastic and we're going to lose mechanical energy. 
We start with gravitational potential energy that turns into translational kinetic energy. There's no rotation yet. Substitute our definitions, and we've solved for final velocity just before it hits the teeter-totter. So we know that this mass is going to be moving at the square root of 2gh. Time to bring out the other hammer. We know that angular momentum is going to be conserved before and after this collision. So this is an important part. You've got to think about what items have angular momentum and how am I going to write that down? Clearly, the teeter-totter isn't moving yet, but the mass is. What are you going to write down for angular momentum of the mass about the pivot point? Well, we should treat the mass like a point mass, so it's going to have angular momentum rmv. Then afterwards, you're going to have the teeter-totter, which you can treat as a rod about the pivot point in the middle, and also a point mass. So you're going to have mr squared for the point mass, and you're going to have 1 12th ml squared for the rod. And again, the physics part is over. Here you just solve for omega final. Simplify, and we're done. Well, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. This has been Mr. H Physics showing you how to use these hammers to solve problems.